You know, as I've been seeing it snowing so much, as you all have, um, I've had this verse going through my mind from Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. What a beautiful foreshadowing of the gospel. That though they are, are red, it is messy, I'm going to make it as white as snow. And in, as much as the snow is covering the ground right now in the coming weeks and months, you're going to see, we're going to see this snow turn from white to brown or <laughs> melt. People are driving over it. That's going to be a common sight in the coming months. One thing you will not see, though, is for brown, dirty snow to turn back to white. That's what God does. God is the one who, who reverses the natural process whereby things become dirtier and more broken down and he heals the sick. And he forgives the sinner and he restores the broken to life and wholeness. And I think this is a beautiful picture of what we have been seeing in Mark, the Gospel of Mark, which we're going through week after week as a church is going through this Gospel of Mark where we see one evidence after another of Jesus' power and Him bringing the kingdom of God. We just said, let my, let my kingdoms fall. We want God's power. We want God's reign. And that is what Jesus is doing, not this theoretical, philosophical kingdom where He's just throwing out religious axioms. He is bringing real power and real change into the lives of real people like you and me. And so we're continuing that this morning. Mark chapter 6 is where we are, and we're finishing this chapter today after five weeks in it. And so if you would turn in your Bible to that, you can. If you don't have a Bible, grab one of those out of the seat backs around the room. And uh, would just love to have you follow along. Each week, one of the priorities, a big priority for us, is that we would hear from God together. And so whoever's standing up here talking is less relevant to me than the fact that we're all here to hear from God and what he has to say to us. But as you're turning there to Mark 6, I wanted to quickly recap last week because it's going to come around this morning. There's a reference to last week in the verses this morning. But right before this moment, Jesus took a tiny amount of food that he got from the disciples and he multiplies it, feeds a huge crowd, a, an amazing miracle. And one thing that I didn't point out last week is I think it's fascinating that rather than just snapping his fingers and saying, let there be food, which we know he can do because he said let there be light, but instead of saying let there be food, he looks at his disciples who've got nothing, well, almost nothing, and he says, how much food do you have? Just fascinating. And as we saw, they hardly had anything. And the little that they did have, they borrowed from a little boy in the crowd. Hey, can we have your food? And isn't it amazing, though, that Jesus started with what they had, that little bit, and he multiplied it to bless so many people. And as I was thinking back about that this week, I thought, how much of the time do we despise the little that we have? Whatever it is you have, a lot of times we look at someone else. We maybe say, well, I don't have as much as them. And we get into this trap of comparing ourselves to other people. And we maybe, as a result, don't even bring the little we have to Jesus because we immediately decide he can't do anything with this. And yet look at what Jesus did when they said, this is what we've got. And he said, all right, here we go. I think that is powerful and a good reminder that Jesus doesn't say, you feed the crowd. He says, what have you got? I will work with that. But that's what we saw um, last week. And speaking of that, just bringing what we have to Jesus, just if you would, join me in prayer as we look to the Scriptures together. Jesus, this is um, a little offering. We don't bring you anything. We bring you ourselves. And we ask, Lord, that as your word speaks today, as you yourself are speaking in this room, alive in this place, Lord, that you would multiply what happens today, as small a piece of this is, and in our weeks, in our years, that you would multiply this time for your glory in our lives. Amen. So verse 45, after feeding this crowd, it says, immediately 
he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, where he dismissed, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. Now, we're just going to look at that for a second because Jesus made them get into the boat. That word literally means compelled or forced them into the boat. And you may wonder why. Why would Jesus compel them? And then Mark, who we know loves to use the word immediately, 42 times in Mark this word shows up. He's kind of like, yeah, immediately, immediately. He's a fast action kind of guy, probably because he's writing Peter's perspective. But either way, this is an appropriate place for him to use this word. But why the urgency? Why were they trying to get out of there? And we find the answer to this question in John, in his account, in verse uh, chapter 6, you'll see it up on the screen. The same event, it says, when the people saw the sign that he had done, feeding the crowd, right? They said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, what a picture, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So we find out that, that Jesus is trying to get away. He's getting his disciples out of there. He is getting out of there because they're starting to put together who he is. And we may think, well, that's a good thing, right? Normally, yes, that is a good thing to figure out, oh, Jesus, but the problem is what we as humans do with that kind of information. Because you see, as you continue to read in John, which I'll let you do later, these people are acting like they won the lottery. Jesus is their jackpot. And they're trying to take him and tie him down and make him king. Basically, Jesus, you stay here. We know where you're at now. Why did they do that? So they could keep getting free bread. As you continue reading in John, that's the reason. And so Jesus withdraws there. And I think it's worth asking the question, how, to, how would we re respond if everyone was throwing themselves at us and worshiping us and saying, I want you to be our leader and our king and we just want to do everything that you want us to do. How would we respond to that usually? I think we would probably, most of us, think of that as the jackpot. Yeah, everybody loves me. And yet what does Jesus do? He withdraws from that. He pulls away from that temptation because that's not why he came. We're going to see in chapter 7, Jesus begins to talk more and more about why he came. And it's not this. So he withdraws, he prays, he focuses himself, spends time with the Father, and then at the same time, he sends his disciples away in this boat. And as we pick up in verse 47, it says that when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them, and about the fourth watch of the night, which is about 3 a.m., he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart. In other words, uh, literally, be of good courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased and they were utterly astounded for they did not understand about the loaves for their hearts were hardened when they had crossed over they came to land at Gennesaret and he uh, and moored to the shore and when they got out of the boat the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and bringing uh, began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was and whenever, wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. So we made it to the end of this chapter. And with these last verses, there's sort of the high point of Jesus' healing ministry. There's almost this frenzy of activity as people run from town to town and telling people, Jesus is here, Jesus is here. And they're going and getting even their sick friends and, and people that they know that are sick, carrying them on their beds to Jesus. So just picture this processional of beds down the road, going down the road. Where is Jesus now? Oh, he moved on to that town. Okay. And they're sort of swarming and flocking to Jesus. And not only is there an increase, it seems, in the amount of people coming out to see Jesus, but almost an increase in the amount of power going out from Jesus. 
Back in chapter 5 of Mark, there was this lady who came up to Jesus who had a disease for 12 years, a bleeding disease, and she did what? She touched his garment and was healed. That's the first time you see that. Just touched his garment. And so I think word of that moment, that event, has probably gotten out, it seems. (laughs) Did you hear that lately she just touched his clothes and was healed? And so people are flocking out and and not even just like grabbing his garment, just like the, the, the fringe. They're brushing by him, it seems, and being healed. Amazing. Speaking of amazing, though, Jesus, who has constantly been defying the laws of nature, those things that we consider to be so unshakable and unchanging and unyielding, Jesus has no problem with them. And that shouldn't surprise us, because what do we know about Jesus? Why doesn't he have trouble with the laws of nature? He made them, okay? If you want to read later Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, those first chapters in those tell us that Jesus created all things. He created these processes that we consider to be supreme. And he has no problem manipulating these processes which he created. And he manipulates this process here in an unprecedented way, which we've never seen um, since, before, or at all. Jesus walks on water. And again, as you know, that, that doesn't happen very often, or really at all, I don't think. But this is such an iconic moment that it has come, I think, in many ways to represent Jesus' divinity, the height of his perfection and divinity. There's this silly bumper sticker that says, uh, the next time you think you're perfect, try walking on water. So there you go. Um, But Jesus walks on water, which is just, you know, a cynic or a skeptic might be able to say of other things that happened up to this point, you know, he healed the woman of a fever. Well, (laughs) she probably just was, it was her time to get better, you know. This isn't something really, they didn't have wave runners back then or anything like, so he's defying these, these rules that we would say, well, there's nobody that can mess with that. Jesus is messing with it. And we're going to look at this miracle, specifically though the disciples' response to Jesus and his power in this moment. But this all began when he sent them out on a boat. And let me ask, just for our memory here, recalling what we've seen in Mark, is this the first time the disciples have gone across the sea? No, it's not. Mark Mark chapter 4, they're also crossing. They're also doing it in the evening. There's also a storm and so they're, they're going out. And by the way, how did the disciples do in that on a, on a faith spectrum? From calm and collected to totally losing your mind. <laughs> they're over here, right? Totally losing their mind. They fall apart. And so when Jesus says, hey, guys, we're going to go across again. I am pretty sure that that near-death experience was still fresh in their minds. We're going to go across. And, and, and the worst part, I think, is that the biggest difference between Mark 4 and this crossing is what? Yeah, Jesus didn't say we're going to go across. He said, you're going across. <laughs> I'm staying here. You're going across. And so they're probably like, oh my goodness, what if a storm comes and there's no Jesus to wake up? I don't know if you know, the Sea of Galilee um, is notorious for sudden storms. One moment it can be beautiful and sunny and the next there's waves crashing in and you're fighting for your life. And as we see, their worst fears come true. There's this storm that arises while they're out there, and they're fighting to move and make progress. And and just so you know, for some perspective, this particular journey took about two hours to make. In good weather, you could expect to spend about two hours on the water. But after an estimated nine hours, John tells us they were about halfway across the sea. And just picture that, dark and stormy and wet, and you're beyond exhausted, and you, you're fighting the waves, and you can't stop fighting the waves, or you go down. And again, the worst part is Jesus isn't there. At some point, though, one of them looks up and notices something in the distance. And they see someone or something walking on the water. And they make, by the way, a very natural, logical, reasonable conclusion that because humans can't walk on water, right, this has to be a ghost. 
It's a ghost. It's some spirit that's coming out on the water. And so they're terrified. And I think, you know, it would be amazing enough if they had looked out and seen Jesus swimming across the sea. You know, people do that like the English Channel and they're swimming and they'd be like, go Jesus, you know, you can make it. But, but him walking casually, you know, making his way. Oh, I missed the boat. I'm just going to walk across. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. Unprecedented. And I think it is fascinating here that, that Mark points out Jesus intended to pass by them. Now, I, I don't think there's any conflict there with me if I were to say Jesus, in fact, intended to go past and meet him on the other side. Jesus always knows what he's doing, and it's for our good. It's for the, the good of these guys, even though it's not easy. So he could have been going past. Some commentators, however, say, no, 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 because Jesus wouldn't do that. He wouldn't, you know, leave his time of prayer after seeing them in trouble and then move past them. Some people say maybe he passed by in the sense of passing near them. That started me thinking, actually, to all of the times in the Bible, many times, when God draws near to people, but then he leaves the last couple steps for us. I think that is a fascinating aspect of the nature of God. Rather than just saying, I'm going to fix the problem, he sort of shows up and then allows us to call out to him. I think a cool example of this is the burning bush. Moses is in the wilderness, and he's tending to the flocks, which was his job. That was his routine. He's going about his daily routine. He looks over and sees a really strange sight, a bush that's burning but not being burned up. And up till that moment, God has not revealed himself to Moses. He's, he's just looking at this bush, and if Moses had said, oh man, that was, oh, I had bad pizza, whatever the reason was, and just gone with his job. I got to get these sheep to the next pasture. <laughs> That's weird. Who knows what would have happened? But it's not until it says he turned aside, which I think that's a really valuable little point for our lives. When, how often do we turn aside from our routines? He turned aside and went over to the bush to see what it was going on. And then what? God spoke. God revealed himself to him. He was kind of teasing. He's like, waiting. how interested are you in this? I think the best example of this particular way of thinking about it is Luke 24. You don't have to turn there. It'll be on the screen. But after Jesus died and he was raised again, there's these two people walking along the road, and they're, they're wrestling with these things related to this guy named Jesus. He, he, you know, we thought he was the fulfillment of these prophecies and he did amazing things, but then he was crucified and they're wrestling with it. And Jesus shows up without them knowing it's Jesus somehow. And he's walking with them along the road, explaining all of these things, starting with Moses and the prophets and helping them understand that these things had to happen. They were written about, they were prophesied. But this is fascinating. They get to the end of this long journey. It says in verse 28, so they drew near to the village to which they were going. In other words, their conversation's about to be over. And he acted as if he were going farther. Let's just enjoy that. Like how Jesus is like, all right, see you guys later. And what happened? They urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it's toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. See, it's not that Jesus wanted to get away from these guys. He wanted to see if they wanted him near them. Do you still, you still want to keep talking? Have you had enough? And they're like, please stay. Okay, I will. And so it could have been that moment, you know, here they're, they're, Jesus is passing by the boat. He's like, I wonder how much they think they need me. Maybe they think they can bail out the water and get across on their own. Whatever the reasons, whatever the intentions, what I want us to notice is what ultimately compelled Jesus to call out and make himself known and say, don't be afraid, and then come over and get in the boat. What is it that compelled him to do that, apparently here? They were terrified. They were terrified. They were afraid, and it says there, he saw them, and they, uh, they saw him, and, he, and they were terrified, but immediately, like he didn't skip a beat. As soon as he noticed they were terrified, he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. I think that is a powerful reminder that Jesus doesn't want us to be afraid. That sounds so fundamental, but how practical. And here's the thing. Are we going to be afraid? Yes or no? 
yeah, we are. We're human. Are we going to have moments where we're scared and we don't know what's going to happen and we think we're going to die? Yes. But all through the Bible, you see it is never his desire that we stay afraid. We stay in that place. Just some verses I want to throw out to you. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. What a contrast. John writes this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Jesus wants them to know his love for them in that moment. He wants them not to be afraid. I love David's prayer in Psalm 34. He said, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from how many of my fears? All my fears. Literally, all my fear was cast out when I sought the Lord and he delivered me. He answered me. Isaiah 41, God says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. And finally, Psalm 23, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which I think is a metaphor for as bad as it could get in your life. The worst possible scenario you can imagine. Even though I am there in that place, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. All through the Bible, we see God's heart to expel fear, to say, don't be afraid. In fact, I read this in a couple different places. I've never gone through and counted, disclaimer. How many times in the Bible does God say, don't be afraid or fear not? Anybody? 365. One for every day of the year. All right. But what we see, so many of those verses over and over and over, this is important. What is the basis? What is the, the rationale for us not being afraid? How do we not be afraid? Because does it help you when someone comes to you and says, don't be afraid? Is that helpful? Maybe it is. I mean, maybe that's a prompting for you to turn to God or go, you know, pray. Or I, I don't know. It, it doesn't help me that much to just say, stop it, you know. But when you look through the Bible, you don't see the self-help sort of approach. You don't see people trying to, you know, if it weren't for these silly circumstances, I'm going to try to manipulate that world out there, then I won't be afraid. It's not just merely focusing on something else, which can be practical and helpful. What we see over and over, what is the basis for not being afraid? Yeah, it's on the screen. I am with you. Jesus is with you. Jesus is with me. And in this case, there was a physical separation because of Jesus being there in the flesh. We don't have that problem anymore. Jesus is with us by his spirit. He is with us. Now, he may, have, he may be passing near you and waiting for you to call out to him. But that is the secret. That is what expels fear. So he calls out. He says, don't be afraid. It's me. And notice what happens when he gets in the boat. What happens? The waves stop. Now, by this point, it should start to feel like Groundhog Day for the disciples. They, you know, cross over the boat, there's a storm, it's night, and Jesus comes, and the waves are calm, and they maybe could have been like, yep, there he goes, doing it again. But how do they respond? How do they react? Verse 51, he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. I, I just have this compulsion of looking up the, the, you know, the Greek words, and I'm not a scholar, I promise. I just have an app on my phone, and you go and you look at the, yeah, every, anyone can do it. Uh, but you go on there, and, and there's actually four Greek words for these two. Utterly astounding. Here they are. We'll show you real quick. In the Greek, it's literally, they were exceedingly amazed, there's two, beyond measure, and they marveled. So it's like this, this piling upon as blown away as you can possibly be in that moment. And the question is, why did they react this way? Okay, now, I'm sure most of us would say we know why they reacted this way. Who wouldn't react that way when he steps into the boat and everything stops? But the reason Mark gives us for their reaction is not the reason you would think. He says this, they were utterly astounded in verse 52 because for they did not understand about the loaves for their hearts were hardened. Now that line almost seems random. Why in the world would he bring in this reference to the loaves in a seemingly unrelated event? Why would he bring in 
the loaves here. I think, first of all, it, is, it, is, it should be surprising to us to find out that the disciples didn't get it. These guys who were there saw Jesus. They brought him the, the, the five loaves and the two fish. They handed all of the food out to the people. They collected the leftovers. Like, how could you be any more front row seat to this miracle? And somehow, Mark tells us, they did not understand. But why does Mark mention it here? Why the loaves? Why does he make this reference? The reason is to help us understand their reaction. That they were exceedingly amazed beyond measure and marveling. Why? Because... They didn't understand the loaves. Now, this is fascinating. Again, that word for understand means to ponder, to consider, to think about. They didn't didn't consider, so he's literally saying they were utterly astounded because they didn't consider or ponder what Jesus had done in that previous miracle. And their hearts were hardened. In other words, guys, they saw it, but they weren't changed by it. They witnessed it, but it didn't shape their perspective of Jesus and what he is able to do. And by the way, when something is unaffected and unchanged by something else, that's the definition of hardness. Their hardness of heart. And when you read about this in the Bible, what I, I automatically picture for hard-heartedness this you know, somebody with their, their, their fists clenched and they're in willful rebellion against God. But I think the far more common and accurate interpretation of that condition is someone who is just simply unaffected by the influence of God in their life. They've seen things maybe, they've experienced some stuff, but in the long run, their perspective is unchanged. I was out in front of our house a couple of weeks ago with my two youngest kids, and I was kicking the snowbanks. Some of you, your snowbanks are like growing, right? And I was kicking the snowbanks, and the snow was collapsing, and they were picking up little pieces of snow and throwing them for our dog. And, and I was just moving down the driveway doing this, and I got to a part that was like solid ice. <laughs> and I didn't know it until I kicked it. And I was just like, mmm, and my like, spine just like shook. And I looked at it, and it, it, it hadn't moved. Despite the influence of my foot, despite the power that I exerted on that, it didn't change. And I think it is fascinating, this word for hard. Their hearts were hardened. That word was used in this culture to talk about the phenomenon of a callus. You know what a callus is, right? If you walk around long enough without shoes... In the summer, your feet won't hurt as much because you develop calluses. Now, let me ask you, who created calluses? Who created calluses? God. God created the process by which we develop calluses. And I'm very thankful for calluses as a guitar player. (laughs) That just means that over time, if you stay with that thing and that influence goes like this enough, you'll become less sensitive to it. So it's a gift from God, but the problem is that we as humans in our fallen state, in our sin, we actually become changed and shaped by the things we should be hard to, and we become hardened and desensitized to the things that should change us. We exchange right for wrong and dark for light, and we glory in the things we should be ashamed of, and we're ashamed of God and his glory. So these calluses have been twisted and turned and affecting our hearts so that we're not changed the way God wants us to be changed. And to apply this to this this multiplying of the bread and the fish miracle, it's focusing so much on the food and the hour of day it was and, and how are we going to feed all these people and we don't have enough money. So much on that that you totally miss the power of God at work right in front of you. And you're not shaped by that. You're shaped by the problems, the demands. Well, I'm glad we came through. and I'm glad there was enough money. I'm glad we had enough resources. You see, the disciples had more than enough evidence 
Time after time after time, Jesus had done amazing things right in front of them. And so they really by now should have been like, Jesus can do anything, right? So rather than saying, where are we going to get all this food for these people? They should have been like, wait, we don't need food. We have Jesus, right? And in the middle of the storm, we're going to die. We're going down. One of them, at least one of them should have said, hold on. Jesus knows we're here. He's done this before. And oh, look, here he comes. (laughs) And so even though, you know, I think it is natural to think that being astounded by Jesus is a good thing. Shouldn't we be astounded by Jesus? I think in some sense, yes, but also I think we see here they really should not have probably been so astounded. And before we get too hard on these disciples, um, this is us, isn't it? This is what we are like. We're blown away when God works. And um, I think of those animals that have seven-second short-term memories. I don't know if it's a goldfish or a dog. Pick the most flattering animal for you. But we've seen so much. We've experienced so much of his power and his faithfulness over and over. So many evidences. I just think of the reality of this world and being in this world. And you understand why the writer of Romans says we have become willingly ignorant. Now, I should say, when when we at Those who have rejected God, those who are apart from God, are willingly, purposefully finding ways to deny the reality of what God has done. They don't want to look at it. They're hard to it. They're not affected by the sun coming up as if that's something that normally, oh yeah, of course, the sun came up. What? Or the fact that we have miraculous like body parts that work because our minds, like, we should just be forever like, man, there's nothing God can't do. And yet, no matter how many times God shows himself faithful, he, he, he is, uh, proves himself to us by his power. What happens so often as humans when we get into a tight spot? We panic. We think God has left me. God doesn't know. He doesn't care. He's going to abandon me. Contrary to all of the previous evidence, we forget And we panic in those moments. And friends, one of the questions that just was nagging at me this week that I was thinking about is how do we not do this? How do we respond differently? How do we become shaped and changed by the influence and the power of God and the faithfulness of God so that our perspective of God moves along with his movement in our lives? How do we avoid being utterly astounded every time God does something? How do we avoid being shocked when he heals? As if, whoa. (laughs) Based on these verses in Mark, the answer I think is very straightforward. It's not simple, but it is to consider the metaphorical loaves in our lives. It's to ponder. It is to understand what God has done. It's to count the evidences of his power and his faithfulness. It's to glory in the fact that all of us should be separated from God forever because of our sins. And yet, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us. He was beaten so that we could be healed. Amen? We should ponder these things. We should think about them. Write them on a note card if we have to. So that our hearts are moved and shaped and that we are not influenced by the things that we should not be influenced by (laughs) because we're being influenced by the power of God. We consider these things. We're softened, we're shaped, and that's why it's, this is a constant theme in the Bible, by the way. Remember, remember, consider, don't forget. Here's some verses. Very quickly, I'll list off a few. Deuteronomy 7, 17, God says, if you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? This is fear, right? It's just like looking at the waves. How's this gonna happen? You shall not be afraid of them. You shall, what? Remember, say that word with me, go. Remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. That's the remedy for fear is Wait a second, has God ever abandoned me? Has God ever shown himself faithful to me? Hmm. 
and we remember, and that is the remedy. First Samuel 12, he says, consider what great things he has done for you. What a nice verse. First Chronicles, David writes, remember the wondrous works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. Remember his word. Remember what he has promised about what is coming. Don't lose sight of that so that you're not shaped by the fear of our culture. Be influenced by him. Psalm 42 says, David writes this, my soul is cast down within me. Raise your hand if you can relate to that. Translation, I'm depressed. I'm down. There doesn't seem to be any light at the end of this tunnel. And he doesn't stop though. He says, therefore, I remember you. From the land of Jordan and of Hermon and from Mount Mizar. Now when I read that, I'm always like, that is, that's obscure. I gotta go like study those things. But that's profound. You know why? This is David's personal memoir. This is his remembering. These are the specific examples that have been brought to his mind of times when God did not abandon him. And so every single one of us could write this verse and rewrite it. And your answers would be different. Therefore, I will remember you from that one time when my child was rescued. I will remember you from that one time when I crossed over from death and sin into life and righteousness. Amen? And you make your own list. And it's specific to you. But the point is that when we do this, guys, when we, when we consider the loaves, whoa, we are shaped and we are prevented from being, on the one hand, plunged into panic every time something goes wrong, and on the other hand, being shocked when God shows up and he shows himself faithful. And I think that is kind of the point. Well, believe it or not, there was one man in this boat who responded differently. You know what I'm talking about? He responded differently. One man who seemed to have been softened and shaped and his, his view of Jesus was changing. Who was this man, by the way? Peter. Yes, Peter actually got out of the boat and walked on the water with Jesus. And it's surprising to me Mark doesn't include this. <laughs> because remember, of course, Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark, but whose perspective is it? Peter's. Why wouldn't Peter include this? Maybe he didn't want to boast. He didn't want people, you know, I walked on the water. Maybe he didn't want people to know what happened after he walked on the water. I don't know. But either way, I want us just with the rest of our time, the last several minutes, to look briefly at what happened that night related to Peter, with Peter's experience. And so um, if you want to turn to Matthew 14, it's from Matthew's account of this event. Um, the verses will be on the screen as well. But the reason I think it's important to go over here is because I don't want us to just hear about what we should or should not do. Don't be afraid, you know. Um, remember, consider. Those are great. That's good. Let's do that. But I want us to see an example of what it looks like for somebody to be changed in a dramatic way by what they've seen Jesus do. So Peter, and just so you know where we're jumping into the story related to Mark, this is after Jesus made himself known, said, don't be afraid, it's me, but before he comes and gets in the boat. So Jesus identifies himself, and then in Matthew 14, 28, Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. There's that human struggle. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So it's fascinating, even by the end of this, we see that perhaps the whole group is starting to be shaped starting to be changed. Now, they struggle with the loaves thing for a while longer. We'll get into that later on. But in the beginning, they're terrified. Jesus calls out, identifies himself, and this is when one dude in the boat does something totally irrational and unnecessary. Jesus, hey, if it's you, if it is you, he's confirming, <laughs> Lord, command me to come to you on the water. Why would anybody do that? Like, I would just say, okay, good, Jesus, get in the boat with us. 
command me to come to you on the water. How many of you ever heard of a trust fall? <laughs> my boys have been, my older boys have been into this thing lately, trust fall. And I was in the kitchen a couple weeks ago, and I hear my oldest boy say, Dad, trust fall. And I know what a trust fall is, but I've never done this with my boys. This is new to me. They, you know, at school or something, I don't know. I turn around, and my oldest boy, Aaron, is like this. And he's going, and I like caught him and stood him up, and I'm like, Aaron, like, you have to wait. You have to let me like notice you. And then one of my other boys saw it, and it was like, it was like, you know, they were infected by the moment, and they rushed in and said, Dad, trust fall, do me, you know. And, and so I'm like, picking up one boy after another, but, I, but I, in my mind, I'm like, well, what if I drop them? What if I hadn't turned around in time? They didn't think about that. And neither does Peter. And I want us to just, with our closing, make three quick observations on Peter's actions here and apply it with a question and rather a prayer um, for each one of us to pray and take home. First of all, I want us to see that Peter got out of the boat in response to Jesus' command. Now, it's a pretty fast moment. We might not think about this, but Peter, noticed didn't just say, hey, Jesus, I'm coming. Why? Trust fall. <laughs> because he knew that if it was not Jesus' will, it wasn't going to work out. On the other hand, he knew that if it was Jesus' will, nothing would stand in the way. Jesus, do you want me to come out to you? Come. Boom. <laughs> He responded to Jesus' command. And so I want to ask this question this morning, and I normally will ask a question like it's me talking to you. What do you, what do we need to do? But this, these are worded as prayers because this isn't, the answer doesn't come from me. The answer's not going to come from you. You're not going to go home and make something up. This is something Jesus will reveal to you and to each of us. And it's this, Jesus, what command from your word do I need to respond to today? Would you just pray that with me right now? Jesus, what command from your word do I need to respond to today? That may be something that you read recently in the Bible. It may be something you heard this morning. It may even just be a prompting from Jesus that's not in, it's not a scripture. He's prompting, he's calling you, and he's basically saying, come. Number two, Peter didn't experience supernatural power until he stepped out of the boat. That's profound to me. And I think it is safe to say that, that the hardest step for Peter was probably what? The first step. Can you relate to that? It's because it's unknown. I've never done this before. I, I, I don't know what is going to happen if I actually do this. But did you know that that step is where his faith was proven? It's where it was revealed and shown for all of us to enjoy for thousands of years. Peter had faith in that moment. The rest of the disciples just hung out in the boat. Okay, Jesus, get over here fast. They're terrified. Peter steps out of the boat. And I think it's funny, sometimes we pick on uh, Peter. Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Doubt, by the way, literally means to be divided in two. That's interesting, our perspective. All of a sudden we've got, oh, my problems. Jesus, yes, but problems were split. He says, why? Oh, you of little faith. But here's the thing. Matthew 17, Jesus says what? Even the faith of a mustard seed can move mountains. At least he had faith. <laughs> right? The dudes in the boat apparently didn't have any. They didn't move. They stayed right where they were. He had enough to step out, and he walked on water. And so here's the second prayer that I want us to pray together. Jesus what is one step you want me to take today moving me out of my comfort zone? Where is Jesus saying, as he said to Peter, come, come, step out. And maybe for you this morning, this is literally your first step toward Jesus. Maybe this is all new and you're thinking, I, this, I've never taken any steps. How cool. That today could be the day you step out of that familiar life that you have been living with all of these promises of fulfillment, and yet there's nothing that will fulfill except Jesus. And this is the day you get to step out of the boat and say, I'm walking to you, Jesus. I pray that happens for you today if it hasn't. 
What's one step? And then here's the last observation. Peter looked to Jesus, which is awesome. It's commendable, but he needed to keep looking to Jesus. He needed to keep looking. That was his, his success was tied to his focus on Jesus. And I, I say this because as Christians, sometimes there's a possibility to think, I looked to Jesus when I prayed to receive Jesus. And now I get to go to heaven. It's kind of like this. We touch base with Jesus once and we'll see him one day, kind of a Christianity. But then there's another version of that Christianity where we, we look to Jesus in the morning. I read my Bible. I pray and I have that moment, but then I'm off to the races. <laughs> it's off to the waves. I'm looking at the problems of the day, the problems of the life, and then I like try to get myself back up onto the water the next morning. Peter here demonstrates for us we have to keep our eyes fixed on him. Hebrews 12, fix, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Meaning everything comes from him. There's not a thing we can do that he does not give us in terms of power and change. That's why David prayed in Psalm 16, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken or sunk with fear. Worship team, uh, you guys can come up and prepare to close us here, but I, I just want to put out this last prayer. And just to let you know, these are not like pray this prayer and then go home to lunch. I would love for you to write these down and I'll give you the notes if you didn't get them written down. That's okay. Um, but something that we regularly return to, and it's this is the last one. Jesus, what's one practical way this week I can keep my eyes on you? I think that's such an important question because when we say stuff like this, I think we agree with them on this level. Yes, oh yeah, yeah, got to keep your eyes on Jesus. What does that mean? Literally, what does that mean when you go home this afternoon and your kids are fighting? What is one way practically, I don't know for you, that's writing a note, something on a verse on a note card, or maybe it's on your phone, or maybe you, you text a friend, maybe you set aside time in the middle of your day where normally it's morning time and then you're off to your life. 10 minutes in your lunch to calibrate, to focus, to fix your eyes on him. I don't know what that is for you. I'll leave that up to you and Jesus. But I know that we all can grow in this area. So as we close, I just want you to close your eyes with me, if you would. Just breathe. And think for a second, what waves are in front of you right now? What are the waves in your life? What is the tendency to cause fear to arise? which as fear rises, you sink, and you feel that. What is that for you? And I just want to point out that this is not necessarily an active trial in your life or a problem that's taking place right now because life, guys, is like the Sea of Galilee. One moment, sunny, and the next moment, you're fighting for your life. There's a storm. And so I might even expand that to what are the things as you think back that tend to habitually sort of pull you away? Pursuit of money, relationship, problems, fear of the future. I just want to in, encourage you and invite you to surrender that right now to Jesus. Open up your hands in front of you. Jesus, we thank you for your power. And Lord, we recognize that this idea of looking to you is a spiritual truth. You're not here in one of the rows in the room, but you're here among us by your Spirit. And so with the eyes of our soul and our hearts and those senses that you have awakened in those who call you Lord, we look to you, Jesus. And I pray for anyone, Lord, today who has not put their trust in you, that today their, their eyes would be open, they would see the glory of you, Jesus, and they would look to you and live. Lord, do this powerful work. Help us not to be desensitized to the beauty of who you are and the beauty of all that you do and are able to do in our lives, that we would not become bored 
even as we sit and we gather weekly and we worship you, that we wouldn't sit back and say, yeah, whatever. That we'd press in, that we'd call out to you. Lord, help us not this week to be plunged into panic or to be shocked when you show yourself faithful. We look to you today, as your word says in Psalm 34, those who look to you are radiant. Lord, we look to you and we want to radiate with your beauty and your light and your faith and to develop the habit of not just looking once or twice, but Lord, every time we feel our eyes being pulled away, we commit this time to you. We ask that you would multiply what you have done and what you're saying in this moment for great fruit in the lives of these people.